I hope that you are seated comfortably with the light turned down and the curtains drawn, suitably prepared to spend the next half hour in the company of Ellis Weston as he takes us on the first of his guided tours around Satan's playground and knocks on the door of the house at Spook Corner. I am standing on the corner of Speak Avenue and Romulus Crescent in South London. It's no different from a thousand other street corners in towns, cities and villages throughout the country. The house on this corner, number 41, is much the same as any other three-bedroomed council semi. You might have one like it in your street. The family that lives here is quite ordinary. They could be anybody's neighbours. Except for one thing. For the past three months, this house and the family that lives here have been held in the grip of a strange and terrifying force. An awesome, haunting power that grants ordinary, everyday objects a frightening life of their own. To the postman, the policeman, the baker, the butcher's boy, this is just number 41. To the people who live in this part of London, this is the house at Spook Corner. Uh, how, how is that, Justin? You were fine, Ellis, but the atmosphere was a touch too noisy. Sue, go and find something not quite so busy, would you? All right. Try 129, Sue. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mike. To save time, we'll record your link into the first interview now, and I'll dub in the rest when I edit tomorrow. Well, fine by me. Uh, but, but can I say something? It's what you're being paid for. Uh, well, um, well, I, I'm just not sure that I like some of the things we're doing. I mean, adding sound effects to pretend I'm out on the street instead of standing here in the studio. Justin? Ellis, how many radio programmes have you made in your extensive career? Well? Well, I, I haven't. Quite. Just let me worry about truth, justice and the Milky Way, and you read the words and try not to bump into the split infinitives. Now perhaps we can get this finished before the studio managers go into overtime. Ellis, go ahead after the green light coming up now. We present Frank Windsor, Michael Drew and John Abinari in The House on Spook Corner by Bob Cootie. You know, David, I often wondered whether Justin Fawkes wasn't a touch mad. We didn't go that far. Well, he never went into a screaming rage, but you could always sense something there. I could always tell when he was getting annoyed or angry because he'd, he'd sort of invent these strange clichés that didn't make sense. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you know, he once told me uh, that I thought I was the bear's knees, God knows why. But I suppose that we we're all haunted in one way or another. Each of us has our own personal incubi. Even rotten old sceptics like you. There's a rather nasty streak in you, for instance. It shows every now and then. Vengeful. Coffee? Uh, did you make it yourself? Yes. No, thanks. I'll get one in the canteen. Vengeful. Yes, David. Vengeful. Puts people's noses out of joints. Makes great radio, mind you. But your library's full of blotted copybooks, isn't what it? What do you mean by that? Oh, don't misunderstand me. I, I think it worked rather well, actually. It isn't a criticism. I think you do a very good job presenting Satan's Playground. Much better than I ever did. There's a bite in your scripts that I like. Yes, well, can we talk about the programme? I want to get this last one out of the way and get started on the next series. Hmm. There's a bit of a problem. I don't see why. It's just a reinvestigation of the Griggs poltergeist case. I've done this sort of thing before. Where's the problem? Why do you want to do it now? Well, for a start, they're pulling down the house in a couple of weeks or so. Since Spook Corner was a classic poltergeist case, it gives it a lot of topicality. Almost the end of an era. People still come from all over the world to look at the place. Yes, but that's old hat now. The last programme in this series of Satan's Playground goes out in week 26. That'll be ten years, almost to the day, since it first started. So why not go back and look at that very first case? Well, I'm not so sure. It's one of the most celebrated polygonized cases of all time. Yes, we but... ought to be mature enough now to put our own work under the microscope. We do it to other people often enough. Hmm. And it'll be interesting to see what's happened to the family. 
something like that must have changed their lives. Listen to this. I remember Donna and Gary very well, David. There's about 50 hours worth of stuff like that. One of the studio managers found the original unedited tapes in Justin Falk's old office. Only about 2% got used. Old office? But he hasn't been in there for years, not since he got booted up to department head. What, six years ago now? I wouldn't have thought there'd be anything left. The trouble is, David, you can't make this programme without criticising the house at Spook Corner. I don't think that has to be a major theme. Oh, you really do like walking on eggshells, don't you? You know he's up for controllership? Well, it's between him and, what's her name, Meadows, from Political Affairs Department. I know Fawkes is a faecal bastard at times, but this might not be the best time to go around digging up skeletons. You think he'll get to be controller then? Bound to. Meadows is pretty good, but hasn't been head of department long. And there are a lot of problems to sort out if the track record of the producers there is going to be improved. Meadows really hasn't had much time to entertain grand thoughts about the way the network as a whole should be going. Fawkes is more of a socialiser. He's got high profile. And the bosses like him. God knows why. <laughs> A hatchet job on him at this moment might not be in your best interests, or mine. Hatchet job? Oh, come on. You've got to admit your programmes on the paranormal have been hatchet jobs. And I can't help wondering about your real interest in Spook Corner. You didn't want to have much to do with it when we tried to interview you for the programme. When a couple of kids shut you in a cupboard and bang on the door to convince you the ghosts are at work and giggle while they're doing it, it's awfully easy to lose interest. Well, you can't be sure it was the kids. Oh, come on, Ellis. Sure, sure, the kids played around every now and then. And, and maybe it was possible that all the physical stuff was just a pair of them fooling around. But you can't dismiss everything. How do you explain away Peter? Oh, the voice that spoke perfect French. That's the point. It wasn't perfect French. It was even stranger than that. There was something Justin Fawkes discovered too late to put in Spook Corner. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, Gary started to speak in tongues. <laughs> All right, most of it was gobbledygook. Then this character started talking through him that called itself Peter and apparently spoke French. Well, most of us thought it was French, but it was very guttural. It didn't sound right. Now, as I said in Spook Corner, it sounds like bits of bad French mixed in with some nonsense words. Then, just after Spook Corner first went out, Justin got a call from someone in the Mauritius High Commission, the Cultural Attaches Office, who identified the language as Patois. Now, OK, you can say that everything else was fake, fraud, but how in God's name do you explain a 13-year-old working-class youngster in a run-down suburb of South London who'd never been on so much as a day trip to Calais speaking perfect, fluent Patois from one tiny island 6,000 miles away? I give up. But there must be an answer. Oh, if you're not careful, David, you'll have a wonderful future behind you. I know you don't like Fawkes, but watch it. He can cut your throat and you won't notice until you cough. We've worked together for nearly six years, Ellis, and this is the first time you've ever tried to pressure me. You're the producer. You can pull the programme out if you want to. I'm only a freelance hack. No. Oh, and that's not the first time you've tried to pressure me with that line. I know what it's like to be a freelance. I've been there. Justin Fawkes brought me in from the cold to take over Satan's playground. So what happens now? Look, if you really want to go into this again, I'd suggest you talk to some of the people involved, like Christine Vecchi and Donna. Without them anyway, you haven't got a programme. And with any luck, they'll tell you to get lost. And watch what you say about Justin's programme. He was very proud of it. He won an award. Come to that, I was bloody chuffed too. So tell me, Mrs. Briggs, how did it all start? Well, we've always had bangs and things, you know, but you don't take much notice of them, do you? Well, I never did, till the photo exploded. Exploded, you say? I had this picture of my brother on the wall, and it exploded. It just went bang, and, and there was glass all over. And that professor come round and asked me about it. He looked at the photo and the pieces and said he couldn't explain it. It was only later I remembered. Remembered what? The day the photo exploded was my brother's birthday. That professor was Paul Vecchi, head of the Department of Advanced Biological Systems Research at the Woodman Institute, a privately funded think tank working mainly with NATO governments. Dr. Vecchi and his daughter, Christine, 
are two of Britain's most respected parapsychologists. They came to Spook Corner at our invitation to give an independent assessment. Did they say what sort of programme they're making, Guy? Not really, Christine. On the phone, they just said it was going to be open-minded. Oh, the problem with an open mind is that a dreadful load of old rubbish can fall into it. A century ago, poor French children would pick through tips of rubbish to scrape a living. Most times they found nothing. Sometimes they found a piece of detritus they could sell for a handful of sous. But every once in a while, on those very rare occasions, out of the mud and dirt and the muck would come a diamond, a gold ring, a fragment of fortune. <laughs> We're on our way to pick over a few rags. You can fill me in as we drive. The photograph incident seems promising. What's the family like? Oh, working class, not particularly well educated. The mother's a lapsed Catholic trying to bring up her daughter and stepson on social security. Gary's the father's child from a previous marriage. Got left behind when the father walked out a couple of years ago. I spoke to the local radio producer who first dug up the case. Her name's Joan. She says, well, there's a lot of bitterness there. Not the sort of people to resort to fraud, then. Oh, no. There does seem to be a lot of pent-up emotional energy around. Well, classic conditions, really. And we might be able to get a look in before there's too much contamination by the media. I'll poke my nose around the neighbourhood while you're seeing the family. You know, this would have been right up your mother's street. She always had a soft spot for children. Yes, it would have been. It would have been. Gary, go and wash your hands. Oh, now you've been playing. Are you a real professor, like in the films, Mr Vecchi? Well, I'm certainly a real professor. Well, with rockets and things. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I'm a marine biologist. Ah, oh, fish. We've got goldfish in the back garden. You've got to put wire over it to keep out the cats. Gary, leave Mr. Vecchi alone. Go wash your hands. You've been played. They're not very dirty. Just much. go and wash. All right. Sorry about that. It's just natural curiosity. He seems a bright boy. Not really, just a show off. He never gets any good school reports, just spends all day with his head stuck in a book. Do you know he sometimes locks himself in the loo for hours? Really? <laughs> I bet he don't learn nothing from his teachers. He's always thinking about his inventions. Mind you, it's the teacher's fault, spending their time trying to teach them blacks how to talk proper English. Your bathroom is downstairs. It's the door next to the stairs. You'd think the councillor put one in upstairs, wouldn't you? So I suppose we're lucky we didn't have a bath at all till a few years ago. And Donna, where is she? In the kitchen, I think. Donna? You in the kitchen? Yes, Mum. Good. You see, children are very mischievous. They get up to little tricks now and then. It's difficult, of course, for them to fool adults. But unless we can be very precise in our observations, then the sceptics will just say that you and your children are simply liars. Pardon? I'm afraid so. We are dealing with forces that frighten people. Psychologically, sceptics simply cannot accept that this sort of experience can be real. They would rather say that you and your children are the greatest psychologists, the greatest magicians in the world, rather than accept that what is happening is real. Fancy a cup of tea? Donna's got the kettle on. It'll only take a minute. Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you. What about Christine? Do you think she'd like to come in? Uh, Christine is doing her own work at the moment. Oh, hello, Gary. Hello, Mr. Veggie. I'll wash my hands, Mum. Right, go knock Donna with the tea. Where's my marbles? In the kitchen drawer, where you put them. Donna, you see my marbles? No, I ain't. Perhaps you'd like to tell me something about what's been happening here. I hope you won't mind me tape recording it. Oh. I don't write shorthand. Uh, no, no, I don't mind. I suppose it must have been noises first off. We always had noises, even when my old man was here. But these were sort of special. In what way special? It was something like being dragged along, sort of a shush, shush, shush noise. I used to hear it at night, after the kids had gone to bed. Did you ask the children about them? No, I didn't want to frighten them. Well, sometimes they told me they heard things, especially Gary. He used to hear voices, and I didn't want to start them off imagining. And what happened next? Then it were bottle tops and jam jars. I used to keep finding them left open. Funny thing is, my brother used to do that. Was he around at the time? Oh, no, he's dead. Ticker. 
but I remember Mum telling him off about not putting tops back on. And did you take much notice of it? Well, not really. For a bit, I thought it was just the kids messing about. Then the photo exploded. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Well, it shook me, I can tell you. I was sitting here one night with the telly on. The kids was rowing about some programme. Oh, my brother hated arguments. Gary went off to his bedroom in a real half. And I heard this crash on the other side of the room. And the glass on my brother's photo just sort of exploded. There were bits everywhere. Gary was very angry at the time. Oh, well, he couldn't have done it. He weren't anywhere near it. I wouldn't be too sure about that, Mrs Griggs. Ah, oh, tea. Oh. No, we still can't find his marbles. Do you want lump, one lump or two, Mr Betty? Oh, no sugar. Thank you, Donna. I was telling oh. Mr Gletchy about the photo, Donna. Oh, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, but what was really funny was I only realised after that it was my brother's birthday. How do you think it happened? The problem is I was not there at the time. Even if there was a quite ordinary explanation, I really am not in a position to give it. But I've still got the bits. You can look at them. I will look at them, of course. But unless there is something physically unusual about them, I still will not be in a position to say anything positive, Mrs Griggs. You'd best call me Annie. What's that sound? There's a coincidence. My wife was Annie. Well, Anne-Marie, actually. She was French. Hey, hang on, I heard something then, too. Gary, is that you? What's that, Mum? Did you drop something? I thought it came from the bathroom. Oh. Oh, no, it's poured all the shampoo in the bath. Well, let's have a look then, shall we? Oh. And all the bubble bath's been poured out too. Oh. I'll get a recording of this. We found a bottle of shampoo and a bottle of bubble bath laying on their sides on a shelf above the hand basin in the downstairs bathroom. Nobody was in here at the time they fell over. The bottles are almost empty. It has only been a matter of seconds since we heard them go over, and both liquids are pretty viscous, so they must have come out at some speed. Where are the tops? There they are in the bath. That must have been the noise, them falling in the bath. I believe you're right. In fact, the bath itself is quite a distance away which confirms what I suspected about unusual force. And Mrs. Griggs and Donna were with me, so it can't have been them playing tricks. And Gary was in the kitchen. He'd never have got past without us seeing. <gasps> Mr. Oh. Fetchy! Mr. Fetchy, the glasses on the side. Oh, oh not me Christmas glasses. Oh. 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 No sign of threads. The glasses just seem to leap off the sideboard. Fascinating. Look, Mrs. Griggs, I think I'm going to need some equipment from my laboratory, so I'll come back later, if I may. Don't say I started ringing doorbells now. It's probably Dr. Rowney. I'll get it. We broke the glasses. Oh, they're all over the floor. But it won't be. Hello, Dr. Rowney. Good afternoon, Gary. Uh, these gentlemen were coming up the path when I arrived. Hi, Gary. I'm Justin. We've come to make a programme about your ghost. Can we come in? Christine, I think we might have a live one. Something happened? Yes, amazingly enough, it did. Two tops came off bottles in the bathroom and flew for around ooh, five feet. You saw it happen? Oh, well, I saw the tops, but I heard them first, and there was no chance at all of the children doing it. We need some recording equipment. Right. Uh, video, temperature, humidity and static. What was that delegation I saw going in? Oh, that was Dr. Roney, the family doctor, and some people doing a programme about it. I didn't want to get involved, yet. You know what media people are like. I wonder what's going on in there. Anyway, I've spoken to some of the neighbours. Who's that on the path? The path? I can't see anybody. Yes. Can't you see? There, Christine. There. Well, Mrs. Griggs, I think you might have a poltergeist at work here. I think you've got an overactive imagination, Mr. Fawkes. What's a, a poultice? A poltergeist? It's a disembodied spirit that takes over a household, just like this one. Sounds creepy. Oh, they seem to be quite harmless. They just cause a bit of a fuss. Have you ever heard of the Rosenheim case, Gary? No. Well, that managed to dial telephone numbers faster than any human could. They throw things around, they make noises, things like that. Have there been any voices? I don't think so. 
I can smell burning, Mum. I think I'd better give Gary his examination, Mrs Griggs, if Mr Fawkes and his ghosts don't mind. But, Dr Rowney, you've seen things happen here too, haven't you? Mum, I can smell burning. Shush, Donna, there are people talking. Come on, Gary, we'll go to your bedroom. I don't think this discussion is advisable at the moment, Mr Fawkes. You'll excuse the mess, won't you, Doctor? Don't worry. (gasps) What What? on earth? The light bulb's gone. It hasn't just gone, Mrs Griggs. It was thrown against this wall. I can still smell burning. Yeah, that's funny. It's not thrown light bulbs before. Some imagination, eh, Doctor? I have work to do, Mr Forbes. Gary? Oh, my God, there's smoke in the kitchen. It's coming from that drawer. I'll take a look. You don't want anyone to get any hurt. Oh, see, I told you I could smell burning. It's a box of matches. It's still smouldering. Oh, oh, good job we caught that. The old place could have gone up. Not only that, either. Look, look now. The box is still smouldering, but the matches haven't lit. That's impossible. The matches aren't even damp. They should have ignited. And look at the paper in this drawer. It's obviously started to burn, but it's gone out. Oh, my God. Oh, go and see who's making that row, Gary. Yes, Mum. Is it, is it a poulterist doing this, Mr Fawkes? I can't see what else it can be. Quick! Please telephone for an ambulance. I think my father's having a heart attack. Have you heard how he is, Mr Fawkes? I spoke to his daughter on the telephone this evening. He's getting better. Could be out in a couple of days, she says. I wonder what brought it on. I'll have to send him a card. He didn't look well at all when they put him in that ambulance. He was all blue. He's been ill for some time, according to Christine. Ever since his wife died, he's been just hanging on. It's good of you to let us stay here, Mrs Griggs. I the spare room's comfy enough for your friends. They've known worse. Tell me, has anyone seen a ghost in this house or outside it, uh, maybe on the path? And that's something we've never had. I don't think Dr Roney likes you much. Oh, really? Your friends haven't gone to bed already, have they? Eh? Oh, no, no, they're night owls. Ellis is setting up cameras in case anything happens, and Joan's just around to look after the recording equipment. Oh, I see. Who's that? That'll be Ellis or Joan, I expect. All set up, Justin. Now, here's the shutter release. The motor drive's fitted, so all we need to do is press this, mm-hmm. and it'll run off a dozen shots in a couple of seconds. Oh, that clever. And Joan will be down in a minute. Uh, do you want me to make a flask for you, seeing as you might be up all night? Why, that's very sweet of you, Mrs Griggs. But I think we'll be all right, thank you. Suit yourself. Oh, what's that? Well, that'll be Joan. And if it isn't, we're going to have a very interesting time. I had a brainwave, Justin. Now, what was that, Joan? I've set up a light-sensitive diode with a relay switch, so when the flash gun on Ellis's camera fires, the tape recorder comes on automatically. Oh, very clever. Oh. We can reset it from outside the kids' bedroom if we need to. So all we do now is sit and wait. Well, it's past my bedtime. Make yourselves comfy. I hope Mr Vetchie's going to be all right. Do you think he likes grapes? Oh, I'm sure he'll be up and around soon, Mrs Griggs. You'd better go and get some sleep. It's late. What is it? I heard something upstairs. The children are asleep, aren't they, Joan? They were when I looked in on them. Oh. Does Gary or Donna sleepwalk, Mrs Griggs? No, they sleep like locks, them two. Well, somebody's moving upstairs. That's on the landing. Shall I go up and look? No. It's moved to the stairs. Perhaps it's one of the kids going to the toilet. They don't come down for that. We've got pots up there. And all the damn equipment is upstairs. <laughs> Gary, what are you doing off? We wondered who on earth it was. You, you get back to bed this instant. Mrs Griggs. Go on. Go back to bed. It's long past your bedtime. Mrs Griggs, there's something wrong. Gary? Gary? Maybe he's just sleepwalking. All the excitement. He's got his eyes open. People do sleepwalk with their eyes open. Yes, but look at those eyes. Gary. He hasn't blinked once. Gary, say something. Shut up, fat bitch. Gary! Get out of this house. Gary, can you hear us? 
Tu m'emmerdes, gonzesse. Can you say that again? Look, I'll get the tape machine from upstairs. Tu m'emmerdes, Gwyn. Don't sound English. Doesn't sound too polite, either. La ferme, chauve cul. Va le faire enculer chez le grec. Oh, it's French. And he isn't being very polite. In fact, he's being bloody rude. That must have copied it from someone at school. They teach French. They don't teach that sort of French, Mrs Griggs. Can you speak French, Joan? Not very well, but I spent a couple of months in Paris. Que voulez-vous, Gary? Je suis pas Gary. Bloody hell, Justin. Look at this. The tape's all screwed up. Shut up, Ellis. But just shut up. Qui êtes-vous? Je suis Peter. Laissez-moi repier. He says he's Peter and he's tired. De où êtes-vous, Peter? Tout le monde. Laissez-moi repier. Je ne vous connais pas. T'es une greluche. Et ta sœur. Et pisse bleue. For God's sake, what's going on, Joan? We're slagging each other off, Justin. Gary. Sorry, Peter. Que êtes-vous? Une fantôme. A phantom? Oui. Je reste chez Annie. What was all that about? Apart from bad mouthing, he said his name was Peter, and that he was everywhere, I think, and that he was a ghost, and he was staying with Annie. That's my name. He's going back. Hey, sh shouldn't I call Dr. Roney, eh? We'll give him a couple of minutes to get back to bed. If he looks okay, we'll wait until morning. Do you know if there are uh, any French children at his school? It probably won't matter if there are, Justin. There's no way even a French child would talk like that. It's foul. All the same. Couldn't he have just picked up the words somehow? Oh, it wasn't the words. It was the way he used them. I didn't learn much proper French when I was in Paris, but I did learn to swear, and he was doing it perfectly. When I said, Eta sir, he said, El pis bleu, which is exactly the right response in the right context. Mm, yes. Make a note to ring the school tomorrow, Joan. Ellis, what were you saying earlier? Sorry I snapped at you, but you could see what was going on. Yes. Sounded tremendous. Pity we couldn't get it on tape. When I went to look at the recorder, the tape was all jammed up. Maybe Gary did it. I checked the girl and she was asleep. We heard Gary's movements almost from the moment he got out of bed. He didn't have time to do it. Nobody could have done it. What do we do now? Wait, I suppose, and see what happens. Hello, David Morris's office. I'm Justin Fawkes. Is David available? He's very busy. I'll see if he can talk to you. Please hold on, I'm putting you through. Yes, Mr. Fox, what can I do for you? Well, uh, let me explain. I'm producing a new radio series on the paranormal. It's going to be called Satan's Playground. Mm. And it's scheduled for the end of June, beginning of July. It's going to be very open-minded, and we're trying to get a spread of opinion. I've read your book on the paranormal, and I'd rather like you to be in the first program. Uh, what's the subject? The Griggs Poltergeist case. Yes, I know of it, although I haven't been there. We've got some recordings and photographs I'd like you to look at. Perhaps I could come to your office tomorrow. Who took the pictures? Ellis Weston, the presenter of the series. He's handy with a camera. He used a motor drive, so it's almost like a movie. Almost. There's a lot of stuff flying around. What's this group? See the ceiling lamp. It's just started swinging. And if you look along this set of prints, You'll see the swing is actually getting greater. Uh, I really need to see the frame numbers on the negatives. I know how sceptical you are about the paranormal, but you've got to admit that these take some explaining. Maybe. Why are you pointing to the notebook in this one? Now, that was weird. You see the picture in my hand? I was in the room talking to the kids when I heard it fall off the wall. The thumbtack holding it had fallen out, so I kept a careful eye on Donna and Gary while I put it up again. That notebook literally flew off the dressing table and hit the wall. You were watching the children and pushing in the drawing pin at the same time? Yes. That was clever of you. You actually saw the notebook move? I couldn't miss it. It hit the wall just by my head. 
But the dressing table was directly behind you. You couldn't have seen it start moving. Oh, you're just nitpicking. Why don't you come down and see what's happening? I really haven't got time right now, Justin. I'm up to the ears. My publisher's screaming for a manuscript. So you're refusing to come down? No, I'm not refusing. I'm busy. You're going to ignore it? I'm not ignoring it, Justin. I told you. I don't have the time right now. You're not going to be able to ignore this one, David, and you can't use the old excuse of it not being there when you come to investigate it. It's going on now, at this very moment. Look, I'll think about it. If I get time, I'll come, OK? OK, you think about it. Bye, Mr Fawkes. Wendy. Yes, David? Here a minute. What a person. Yes, he's a bit of a creep. Mind you, I've heard some of his programmes. They're very good. He makes good programmes, Wendy, but he's just an ambitious creep. I wouldn't take his word for it if he told me the sky was blue. Well, I suppose I'd better go and see these kids, otherwise he'll never let me forget it. He'll use it as a stick to beat me and every other sceptic in sight. Gary? Can you hear me, Gary? Do you know one of them from the radio? No. I'm David Morris. Uh, Mr Fawkes just asked me to come and have a chat with you. So, uh, you must be Gary. And uh, you're Donna. Yeah. So, this is the bedroom where Peter lives. That's right. Where, where is he? Over there in the corner. I can't see him. Why is that? He's invisible. Can you see him? No. Oh. Sometimes. He's a ghost. No, he ain't. He is. No, he ain't. He ain't a ghost. Well, what is he then? I don't know. He ain't a ghost, that's all. So you don't know what he is, Gary? Uh, is it a he? He told us he was coming. Yeah. He's been waiting for you. He wants to see you. Yeah, he wants to see you. OK, where do I find him? Can I talk to him? He said you had to get in the cupboard. You mean... This cupboard over here? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a tight fit. All right. What do I do now? He says we've got to close the door. Gary? I've got to shut the door. That's fine by me. Piss off. That was Peter. I don't think so. OK. Here I am. What do I do? Hello? Woo! I'm a ghosty! Woo! <laughs> a bleeding teacher, you bugger. Gary? All right. Playtime's over. I'm coming out now. <gasps> Gary, don't you dare! Come on, unlock this door. I'm telling Mum of you. Hey! What's going on out there? Open this door now, the fun's over. Right, I'm telling Mum. Come here, you slag. Come back here, you two. Open this damn door. Are you there? Damn kids. Smoke. The door's hot. A little bastard set fire to the place. Help! Are you all right? Oh, yes. Uh, no thanks to those kids. Oh, you probably owe them your life. Gary told us what had happened. Oh, really? Exactly what did he say? He said that they tried to open the door when they saw the smoke and couldn't. Donna got frightened and ran down to get me. That's what they said? Yes. Why? You might wonder how those burning comics got piled up outside the cupboard. Yes, I know. I wonder why Peter did it. Oh, for heaven's sake, folks. You all right, Mr. Morris? Yeah, we were really worried about you. I'm sure. Justin, this one's all yours. Where are you going? <laughs> David, David, wait a minute. Hey. The new developments here at Spook Corner were truly frightening. 
Over the ten days during which Joan, Justin and I camped out in the house each night, the phenomena were coming thick and fast and apparently more violent. The attack on David Morris suggested a, a worrying malignancy in whatever strange force was at work. I asked Morris whether he would ever return to the house. Frankly, no. Well, why is that? I'd prefer not to comment just now. Well, do you have an explanation? I have, but I really can't go into it, as I think you know. But you wouldn't go back to the house? No. Morning, David. Good morning. Get me that bastard fox on the phone. You're not happy this morning, I can tell. Oh, bloody right, I'm not happy. I heard you on the radio last night. I thought you were very good. <laughs> Just in Fox's office, please. It's on the line. Right. Now, look here, Fawkes. I heard your Spook Corner programme. Good, wasn't it? Good? You've completely changed what I said. I agreed to that interview on condition you either used all of it or none. Oh, come on, Dave. You know what it's like. There just wasn't enough time for it all. But I thought that what you were saying was important. I really didn't have any choice. You cut the damn thing to ribbons. Oh, I don't think so, David. We got the essence of what you were saying. Come on, Fox. I made it quite clear that I couldn't explain what was going on for legal reasons. And I didn't want to go back to the house because I just didn't think it worth it. You can't blame me for that. I checked it out with the lawyers, and they thought that if you said that you couldn't explain it for legal reasons, then there's a chance of an implied libel. I couldn't risk it, David. And without that, your comment about it not being worthwhile just didn't make sense. Look, I'm sorry if you're upset about it. Forks, don't you ever cross my path again. If you do, I'm going to step on you bloody hard. Bastard. What are you going to do, David? Nothing I can do, Wendy. The way he's got me on tape makes his spook credible. I'm going to look like a prat whatever I do now. I can't win. Well, you could always put spook corner in your next book. Expose it. Then it looks like I'm changing my mind, finding some sort of excuse... Anyway, thousands of people must have heard the programme. The number of them who read a book will be tiny. You can be sure that if I criticise a spook corner thing in any way, Fawkes will make sure everyone hears his piece again. It'll be years before I can repair the damage. A little rat ought to be in politics. <laughs> Working there, he probably is. David Morris's ordeal raised ominous questions. Could a poltergeist hurt, perhaps even kill a human being? Professor Vecchi... All the phenomena that we see here are classic poltergeist manifestations. Objects moving, furniture tipping over, noises, and even materials spontaneously combusting. They're all quite normal, at least as far as any poltergeist effects can be normal. I've been studying the literature on this for, oh, I suppose, 20 years now. And to my knowledge, these are usually mischievous, playful effects much as an overexcited child might produce. In fact, this childlike sense is actually reinforced by the lack of actual harm to people. Well, physical harm, anyway. So we don't really have anything to fear from whatever's causing this? Not really. Apart from the odd scratch or bruise. You've had a lot of experience with this sort of phenomenon, and until now you've not committed yourself on any of the cases you've investigated. In fact, you're better known for your exposure of fakes. How do you rate this case? I would like to say that I have no doubts at all that what is going on in this house is 100% genuine. You have no doubts? No doubts at all. Poltergeists may indeed be harmless. But just hours after recording that interview, Professor Vecchi was dead. I wish that wretched little man hadn't told you about Gary's French trances. You're really not strong enough yet. The hospital told you to rest. I'm perfectly all right. That was a very serious heart attack. I'm not a complete invalid. Oh, why won't you let me check it out first? Because it could stop happening at any moment. All the same. This is the corner here. Yes, I know. And don't worry. Nobody's taken me in for the past 30 years, and I certainly have no intention of becoming a credulous, senile idiot now. I don't know about senile, but you're being a fool. You should still be in hospital. Here's the place. All right, all right, I know. You are touchy today. He's into a trance again. Gary, 
Gary, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Oh, I wish you wouldn't do that. If he's going to start that, I'm going in the kitchen. It finds me. Get that, will you, Donna? It'll probably be Professor Vecchi and his daughter. They're due about now. Oh. Hello, Donna. Oh, keep the door open, will you? What did you want your legs, Mr. Vecchi? No. I'm feeling a little tired. If I forget my sticks, I fall over. Can you run on and get a chair ready? Come on, Dad. Lift your foot up. Would you mind if Mr. Vecchi had your seat, Mr. Fawkes? Not a bit. It doesn't look too good. <laughs> Hello, Professor Vecchi. Good evening. Oh, here. Yeah. Let me help you. You look as if you could do with a nice cup of tea. I wish you'd contacted me first, Fawkes. This is an awful strain on my father. It was David Morris who made the suggestion, Christine. Well, and you should have had the sense to know better. Does anybody mind if I get into this conversation? It's my heart that's the problem, not my ears. I'm sorry, Dad. It's a curious fact, Mr. Fawkes, that the immediate response to ill health is to shout at the patient. Or pretend he's not there. <laughs> I'll go and make some tea. I'll give you an hand, Mum. Go and change, first, Donna. Oh, Is Gary in a trance now? I think so. He's been like that for a while. I told you how it started. We were sitting here and he appeared through the door talking French. We've got a tape of him singing, or Peter singing, depending on how you look at it. Mm. You've seen the photographs, of course, with the telephones and the table lamps. Well, my father's looked them over. I can't say I'm impressed. As far as I can see... Your photographer pointed the camera, but looked away and only clicked the shutter when the children said she should. That is a very dangerous technique to... What's wrong with the telephone? Well, as far as the phone people can gather, whatever is here is telephoning the speaking clock and doing it faster than the telephone itself could do it. Are connections actually being made, or is the number just being dialed? Mm, does it make a difference? Even if the handset was put down as soon as the dialing was finished, it couldn't be done as fast. Yes, Mr. Fawkes, it does matter. Everything matters. I'll get to you in a minute, Gary. How often has the trance state occurred? Uh, two or three times a day, sometimes as Peter, sometimes as somebody else. We haven't been able to identify him yet. And there's been the singing, of course. My presenter, Ellis, says the French is reasonably good and he's using slang in the right context. And he's talking about somebody called Annie. Any other names? Well, he sometimes mentions Marie, but it's difficult to make out whether it's a different person or not. Now, that is interesting. Do you know anything of my family history? No, nothing at all. Christine? No, I haven't discussed it with anybody. It's unlikely that these children would have any details. Good evening, Gary. Je suis pas Gary. Je m'appelle Peter. Can you translate, Christine? Papier? He says his name's not Gary. No, Peter. He's Peter. Hello, Peter. Bonsoir, Monsieur le Professeur. He's just saying good evening. Pleased to meet you. Enchanté. We could have got that from anywhere. Ferme ta gueule, putain. He's telling me to shut my mouth. He's a very charming turn of phrase, I understand. He has. You're the first person he hasn't sworn at. That might be a meaningful observation, Fawkes. Peter, est-ce que tu es jeune? Non. Vieille, prof. Très, très vieille. He's old. Very old. Mais tu parles comme un jeune homme. Je suis vachement vieille. Tu me fais une clope, mec. He's asking for a cigarette. Non, je fume pas. T'as raison. It's certainly not schoolboy French. We know, and his school teacher said that his French is pretty bad anyway. Jeanne la salopine. He's calling Joan a slut. Peter doesn't like Joan. I gathered. And his French isn't perfect, which is good. It's more convincing. He'd need to spend some time with a French speaker. To... There aren't any French people at the school, and this is hardly a cosmopolitan area. Well, not in European terms, anyway. Yes, I'll accept that. I've checked independently. Here's some tea, everybody. Toujours le thé. Les Anglais faire pipi toujours. Always the tea and the English pee a lot. Oh, still at it, is he? Mum, he's on loan to Brenda's. He only gives me the creeps when he's like this. All right, but don't be out late. Annie D. Bonsoir. I see. Annie who? Annie says good evening. Anne Marie. C'est ta femme. Tu connais Anne Marie, prof? Marie Anne, you know Aunt Marie Anne. She's your wife. Sure. Oui, bien sûr. Sans blague, mec. Yes, no jokes. Elle est petite? Non, grande. She's tall. Et ses cheveux? Très blonde, avec un petit nez, comme une souris. Elle est bien roulée, prof. Tall, blonde, small-nosed and pretty. Is it accurate? Oh, yes, it's accurate, all right. Trouble is, it fits everybody who isn't a short, ugly brunette with a long nose. Don't let your tea get cold. Is there something specific you can ask? Tu parles français comme une vache espagnole. Qu'est-ce que tu dis? Tu parles français comme une vache espagnole. <laughs> Speaks French like a Spanish cow. Well, that doesn't make sense. Well, that's what he said. I think we can go, Christine. Help me up, will you? Yes. What's going on? Why are you leaving now? I have my answer, Mr. Forbes. 
I'm still not convinced, Dad. I really can't see why he would come up with that specific phrase, Christine. Your mother was always saying that I spoke bad French. She always said, to parle français comme une vache espagnole. It's just too much of a coincidence. Well, I'm not so sure. You in all right? I'm sure now. Anne is here, Christine. She is there. Annie? Annie! <gasps> Let's go back to the office and talk about it. Okay, Dad. You agree? Dad? Dad! Here's your book, Mr. Fawkes. And oh. uh, thank you. I just hope you enjoyed it, Dr. Rennie. I really hadn't realised just how well documented faith healing was. Oh, I'm sorry if I seem so dismissive. You've changed your mind? Well, yes. Yes, I suppose I have. Because of the book? Uh, no, not that by itself. It's Gary. Gary? Well, yes. It's difficult to understand when you're on the outside of somebody's mind. When you know something is happening, you don't know quite what. I'm afraid I'm not making much sense, am I? Go on. <laughs> you haven't got that tape recorder on, have you? No, I'm just waiting for Mrs Griggs and the children. They're upstairs. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's just the telephone. It keeps doing that. The GPO's investigating it. Go on with what you were saying. Well, I've been looking after Gary for two years now. He's a very disturbed boy. Well, you knew that, didn't you? Well, I wasn't sure. Well, quite serious personality disorders. I suppose a few years ago, he'd have probably been diagnosed as schizophrenic. I see. But the odd thing is that since all this started, he's quietened down a lot. And there are other things, too. Uh, what sort of other things? Uh, well, he had a lot of stomach problems, almost certainly psychological, of course. Mm. But all the same, it's cleared up completely. Or well, so have the headaches. And he used to have a lot of skin trouble too. Warts, sores, that sort of thing. So you would say that now he was mentally and physically sound? Well, more or less, yes. Well, a lot depends on what you mean by sound. When I first started in clinical psychiatry, I had a patient at Virginia Water who insisted he could see big, green, slimy hobgoblins on everybody's shoulders. Really? Well, he'd gone into hospital because he was frightened. But what he was doing, though, was somehow seeing a, a personification of people's drives, ambitions and fears. Uh, once he understood that, he could handle it. Fascinating. Well, in fact, after he left the hospital, he became a psychologist. A damn good one, too. And the hobgoblins had gone? Oh, he still sees them. He just knows they aren't there. I wonder what he'd make of yours. Mine? I've been watching you, Mr. Fawkes. This thing is getting through to you. There's a hobgoblin on your shoulder, and it's getting a little bigger every day. I've got to be going. Uh, but, Dr. Roney, I've I... ordered some books on faith healing from the shop round the corner. I want to get there before they close. It's been nice meeting you again, Dr. Roney, but... You see, Christine Betchy, do tell her how sorry I was to hear about her father. Uh, when's the funeral? On Friday, I think. Dr. Roney... Oh, hi, what... Dr. Roney. Hi, hi Mr. Fawkes. Oh, I'll hello. let myself out, Mr. Fawkes. Oh, very well. Now, uh, Donna, Gary, I'd like to go through what you were saying about the chair earlier on. It, it happened while you and Mum was in the kitchen having tea, and it went forward and fell over. Yeah, and no-one touched it. No, it weren't us. I see. Well, what we're going to do is a reconstruction with you two saying exactly what you said then, so people get an idea of what it was like, OK? Yeah, sure. We'll show you just what it was like. Is this the chair? That's Your right. Your Mum's chair, yes? That one. It moved and fell right over. Right. Now, this time... I'll move the chair, and you do what you did then. I'll count to three. One, two, three. Mr. Morris, my father died ten years ago. I'm really not sure I want to bring it all up again. I understand that, Miss Fetchy, but I really am trying to get a sensible, objective view of what was going on at Spook Corner. Then surely the man to ask is Justin Fawkes. It was his invention. He invented the poltergeist? You should know. You work at his feet these days. Frankly, I'm surprised. I've read some of your books. I'd have thought you could have found more honest company. I don't really work at Justin's feet. 
It just happened that when he got promotion, he brought in Ellis Weston to produce. Uh, yes, Weston. He's such a little man. Weston, like my books, asked me to take over the presentation. I agreed, provided I could say what I wanted. Fawkes doesn't actually have much say, really. <laughs> we don't get on. But you were saying that Fawkes faked the phenomena at the house. Oh, no, no. The children did that all by themselves. They were very, very good at distracting our attention, working together at little gems of deception. Fawkes' big lie was in what he didn't tell and the way he put the material oh so carefully together. What about the Mauritian patois? Oh, that was a Justin Fawkes special. I suppose you heard about someone at the Mauritian High Commission saying that Gary was speaking patois. It was in his book about the case. Mm, that's right. But he didn't. He spoke bad French. But he did sing a Mauritian children's song. When Gary was ten, there was a black Mauritian boy called Peter at his school. My father and Fawkes only thought to ask if there were any French children there. They didn't think to ask if there were any French speakers. Of course, the two boys swapped rude words. But what about the Spanish cow statement? Gary went to Peter's home once and tried out his French on the boy's mother, who told him he spoke French comme une vache espagnole. It's a bit old-fashioned, but it's a common enough phrase. Now how do you know all this? Because I checked. There's something else you probably haven't been told. After a few months, Peter and his parents moved to London. You see, the father worked for the Mauritius High Commission. It was he who telephoned Fawkes after the programme was broadcast to explain how Gary could have learned his French. The way your father sounded on the programme, he seemed pretty convinced the children were genuine. But... Perhaps you'd like to hear what my father really said, Mr Morris? Yeah, well... No, no, I want you to hear this. He used a pocket dictation machine quite a lot. I've started writing my father's biography, and recently, when I was going through his tapes, I found this. You've had a lot of experience with this sort of phenomenon, and until now you've not committed yourself on any of the cases you've investigated. In fact, you're better known for your exposure of fakes. How do you rate this case? Well, I'm still not going to commit myself. I would like to say that I have no doubts at all that what is going on in this house is 100% genuine. Every investigator would, but I can't. A significant number of the phenomena we have is certainly fraudulent. So much that I doubt that it will ever be possible to determine what was and what was not genuine without considerably more study. You have no doubts that the children have cheated. No doubts at all. Yes, I have the master tape of that interview. Oh, I see. And it's absolutely identical. Well, I complained to Fawkes about it. And he said... He had to take out the reference to the children cheating because it was libelous. He said that leaving in the comment about no doubts at all was just a slip of the razor blade. <laughs> Sounds familiar. He used the same excuse with me. He didn't care that he libelled my father. You can't libel the dead. That's what my solicitor said. It destroyed my father's reputation. He was working in advanced theoretical physics, right at the edge of what we know about science and beyond. If he appeared to be taking on board this sort of nonsense, it would have damaged his professional standing. Nobody would have taken him seriously ever again. And that's what happened. He was doing work that could have changed science forever. Nuclear physics, quantum physics and astrophysics, even molecular biology. Seriously, his work was that important. There was a whole mass of papers about to be published. After the programme, the Institute put the lid on the lot. Suddenly, the work wasn't sound, they said. Fawkes manipulated my father the way he manipulated the children. And he destroyed him professionally the way they destroyed my father physically. Gary killed my father. Would you go on record, on air, and say that? No. You must understand. My father was very, very ill. He was afraid of dying, passionately so. And he was going to kick and scream every step of the way. His body was going to pieces under him. But he was just too damn cussed to drop dead. After my mother died, he decided to find out if there really was anything to be afraid of. That last afternoon, Gary convinced him that my mother was still alive in some way. Once his fear was gone, he... he just died. But I suppose he died happy? He needn't have died at all. It's too late to help him, I appreciate that, but maybe something can be salvaged. It won't be all, but it'll be better than nothing. And if you could come on the programme and no, say... No, no, no. I'm going to tell the story my own way. When the biography's published, I've had enough of media people. Without them, this would never have happened. I understand. It was good of you to spare the time. I don't suppose you know where I might find Dr Roney. 
I understand you kept in touch with her. Oh, not for some years. The last I heard, she was living in, well, the Welsh mountains in a commune of some sort. Can I help you, traveller? Uh, I hope so. I'm David Morris. We are all stars. Uh, I'm looking and for... kings. Uh, and David Morris. Uh, I'm looking for De Dr Elizabeth Roney. I believe she lives round here. Elizabeth Roney is here. Ah, good. And there. Everywhere and nowhere. Ah. There is no Elizabeth Roney now. Her new life is she. She? Who heals? Where can I find she who heals? She will be by the stream. And go that way. Ah. Ah. Thank you. Leave your ego at the door, traveller. Kai sayana mangla pandera, no mulu so gong kai ta wan sa pang ham sera, ta yoi nat mat saya, iin dat mat paha. How can I help you? I'm looking for Dr. Elizabeth Roney. I believe she lives around here somewhere, but she has another name. Sia I Mangagamut. I'm sorry? Sia I Mangagamut. She who heals. Do you know where she is? You don't recognize me, Mr. Morris. You? Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Uh, ten years is a long time. If you were telling the truth, you'd say I look a lot older than you thought I should. Well, it's the weather and cooking on a cold stove. It does wonders for the spirit, but ages the skin. Funnily enough, water's good for my hands, see? Do you always wash your clothes in a stream? Well, we wash everything in the stream by hand. No soaps or detergents, sometimes some wood ash. It's good for Gaia. What happens when the stream freezes? Oh, it does every November. By February, we all get a bit nippy. We know when the spring thaw is coming, they ban us from the post office in the valley. What are you doing up here? We all have our jobs in the community. We all do basic things like washing and cooking. But some collect water, some look after the small holding. It works very well. I'm a sort of doctor. Well, that's why they call me She Who Heals. Is it a quiet practice? It isn't really a practice as such. They're a healthy lot up here. Second, too. There's usually a mass of children being born come May. Other than that, it's... Just things like friction burns. Between you and me, when there aren't any strangers around, they call me Sister Blister. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about the community. I'm not sure you'd understand. Try me. You're making a programme about Spook Corner, aren't you? How did you know? Oh, there's nothing psychic about it. In a few weeks, it'll be the 10th anniversary of the programme. You and I were both involved one way and another. You make programmes. Pretty obvious. I suppose it is. They're about to knock the house down. They might destroy the house, but they won't destroy the spirit within it. I was treating Gary Griggs then. He was a very unhappy child, you know. Well, not just mentally, but physically too. The strange thing is that when things started to happen in the house, he started to improve. Well, at first I didn't take much notice. Then Justin Fawkes gave me some books to read about psychic healing. They seemed pretty nonsensical. But as Gary improved, I just had to look at the whole thing again. I came across the works of Tony Medina, the mystic and uh, psychic surgeon in Bagueo. I've seen him in the Philippines. Oh, what did you think? Frankly, he's a fake. Oh, no. I photographed him taking out a growth from somebody's kidney. It turned out to be chicken innards and stage blood. Outside, superficially, it probably was, but he does cure. The outside appearance causes the inner reality. Well, anyway, I went to the Philippines and saw him operating in Bagueo, up in the mountains. The first time, we went out among the pine trees and talked. Drank coke and ginebra in a sari zari store. Ate chicharoon and went on talking. I went back to his apartment. 
watch the sun coming up over the South China Sea. We made love. It was... I don't know, that there's no English word to describe it. Like a brilliant crystal rainbow exploding quietly inside. He called it Bayaya Na Bakahari. I see. And from then on, I shared his food, his bed, his life. You don't speak Ilocano, of course. Rizal said, Angwig Asiang Kaluwa Ngbayan. Language is the soul of the nation. <laughs> There's an awful lot I, I can't explain. You make him sound like a cross between Jesus Christ and Casanova. He was a man, an ordinary man. There was nothing very special about him. In fact, I think he used to feel quite proud of having a parole girlfriend. It was all part of the paradox. He even spent Sunday afternoons losing money at cockfights. Mine, mostly. But you say he had a special power. Oh, no, the power wasn't his. It was God who did the curing, and Tony could only act as his vessel if he was in a state of grace. Oh, yes. Tony taught me a lot. And after he died, I decided to come here and set up the Medina community to carry on his work of healing and to train other people. We live and pray and study. But that's all there is to it. Sometimes people come to us for healing, sometimes we go to them. Spook Corner really did change your life, didn't it? Would you say it was for the better? Who knows? Perhaps it would all have happened without the program. But God's usually pretty spry at bypassing the obstacles we try to put in his way. But you had a promising career. You were very respected. And you gave all that up. I gave up nothing. I had nothing. But Tony showed me that. What about all the kids you were helping? God will provide. That's his job. Talking of kids, what did you reckon on Gary and Donna? You saw a lot of them. And they really were a pair of crooks, weren't they? Really? Oh, yes, they were manipulating everybody in sight, and you can't blame them. They had a pretty rotten life with Gary's father walking out like that, leaving him behind. They just wanted attention, and you lot certainly gave it to them. So you do know it wasn't genuine? Oh, that isn't quite what I said. I know the children weren't genuine, but the spirit was. <laughs> just because a couple of kids were fooling about it doesn't mean you have to invest the whole thing with some great mystic significance. I'm afraid I wouldn't be much use for your program. Have you spoken to Gary or Donna? Oh, not yet. I'm supposed to be seeing Donna the day after tomorrow. Give them my love. They never had very much given to them. Your Welsh jaunt, David, has put me right over my budget and you still haven't got a program. That's not true. I'm sorry. I'm not happy with the way it's working out. You haven't actually got anybody to talk on tape. No, but Christine Vecchi and Elizabeth Rowney have given sworn statements. You can't hear sworn statements. Surely we could get actors in to read their words. And none of it is about Spook Corner. It's all about Justin Fawkes. It's all too personal. If we don't do Spook Corner now, we may never be able to do it. You know perfectly well the house is being demolished soon and the Greeks are being moved. By the time the next series comes, it'll be too late. So we don't do it. There's still that recorded programme on psychic detectives. But we always go out with a bang, something that'll stick in the listener's memory and bring them into the next series, something strong. I cannot allow a character assassination of our next programme controller, especially when it isn't a very good programme anyway. You're sure he's going to be the next controller? Well, I can't see Meadows getting it. David, is Spook Corner that important? Yes. If you'd seen Christine Vecchi and Elizabeth Rowney, you'd know it was. Oh, who have you still to talk to? I'm seeing Donna Griggs tomorrow. OK, OK, I'll come with you. Then, well, we'll see. Hang on, I'm coming. Yes? Uh, Miss Griggs, I'm David Morris. I spoke to you on the telephone yesterday. I, I think you know Alice Weston. Hello, Donna. Oh, yeah, I remember. I wanted to talk to you about you and your brother ten years ago. So you said... You weren't sure whether or not you wanted to talk about it anymore? No, I weren't. Well? Well, what? Oh, can we come in? Well, I suppose so. All right, come in. But not for long. My mum will be back in half an hour, and I don't want you here then. I don't want her getting excited. Is your mother ill? Sort of. She is 
right. Ever since it's happened, she's gone all religious. Goes to mass twice a day. She spends all her money going to that medium, Marie Forry, trying to talk to Gary. Gary? Yeah, Gary's dead. Would you like a cup of tea? Uh, no, thanks. Oh, please yourself. What happened to Gary? He got his head blown off in the shootout with some paddies at Cross McGlen a couple of years ago. Oh, I am sorry. Well, I don't think he was. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, he uh, didn't want to get shot, surely? No. But we got a letter after from his commanding officer saying how Gary had been a good bloke and did his job well and all that, you know. Gary would have liked that. Why? Well, nobody ever said he was a good bloke before. He was my stepbrother, you know. But Mum never took much notice of him. Neither did his dad. His dad walked out in the end. Couldn't stand always being second fiddle to Mum and her family. Hmm. Gary wasn't so lucky. Did she ever show you his poetry? Well, I didn't know he wrote poetry. Oh, yeah, it was good, too. He used to spend hours on it. I remember he showed some to Mum once. All she said was, you've copied that. She knew he hadn't. But she just couldn't bear to give him any credit. He cried over that. As soon as he was old enough, he joined the army. He thought at least they'd notice him. And they did. He got into the SAS and was posted to Ireland. Your mother didn't like Gary? Oh, it wasn't that. She just wouldn't give him any credit for anything. Remember the funny things that went on with the telephone and all that spooky stuff was going on? That Mr Fawkes told Gary about something that happened with a telephone in Germany and Gary had an idea. He was good at inventing things. He had this bit of cardboard with tinfoil stuck on it and a couple of wires across it and it used to ring the talking clock. Sometimes he'd get me to do it. Were these all his own ideas? Yeah. He was clever with things like that. He showed it to Mum and told her how it worked. She just said, don't be silly, you're just a kid. Well, what about the other things? Like the bottle tops and the furniture? Mm. Oh, we used to get up to all sorts of things. Like Gary would go into the bathroom and take the tops off a couple of bottles. Then go into the kitchen, wait a bit, and drop a couple of marbles into a mixing bowl. It sounded like the real thing. We used to push chairs up on their legs till they were just balanced and sort of let go and jump, jump away quickly. So it looked like we were miles away when anything happened. Well, but there were photographs. Oh, that was easy. They only pushed the shutter when they heard us make a noise. So we'd throw something or jump about and yell a bit before. We got caught a couple of times, but those photos sort of got lost. Mm. Folks kept all the photographs. And you told your mother about all this? Some of it. But she never believed us, because it was nearly always Gary's idea. We couldn't tell her about the photo, though. Uh, the one that exploded? It didn't bloody explode. Mum used to hang it on the wall on her brother's birthday, see? Used to keep it in a drawer most of the time. Gary and I were playing on the sofa and knocked it off and broke the glass. Well, Mum's eyesight weren't too good, so like kids do, we thought if we put all the pieces back in the frame, she wouldn't notice. Mum heard a noise, so when she came in, we pretended to be arguing about the telly. Gary made out he was really angry and went out and slammed the door, and the bits of glass fell out of the photo frame. Mum went spare. We didn't tell her what really happened. She'd have killed us. So it was all a con? Oh, no. There were some funny things going on. What? Well, like Gary's trances. They were real. He wasn't well, then. You fooled Professor Vecchi and Justin Fawkes. And me, for that matter. Mm. I know. And it was awful. We were just a couple of kids having fun. We could get all the grown-ups to do almost anything we wanted. It wasn't so bad with Mum. But we had all these important people coming along and saying it was all real. There was no way we could turn around and say, fooled you. It got too serious. Even when we tried telling Mum and Mr Fawkes what was happening, they didn't believe us. And when Mr Fetchy died, well, we thought it was all our fault. Imagine two kids thinking they'd actually killed somebody. Oh, it was awful. 
Did your mother know about Gary's school friend, Peter? Oh, you're joking. She'd have skinned Gary alive. Mum couldn't stand blacks. Still can't. That's why we're still in this house. And now the council's moving us, she's really going round the twist. She's read so much in the papers, she's frightened that we'll end up living next to some blacks. It's stupid, but she won't change now. We couldn't tell her about Peter, because he was black. He was nice, too. It's all a bit tragic. The only ones who seem to have escaped are you and Justin Fawkes. He's quite high up now. Oh, I don't know about Mr Fawkes. But what about me? I'm 23. I can't even have a boyfriend because Mum can't look after herself. And the neighbours won't look after her, so I can't go out. The doctor won't put her in a home because he says she's not bad enough. All she does all day is sit and imagine she's talking to Gary and her brother and count her beads. We can't move because Mum's scared to. And I've got that every day until she dies. And the doctors say she's good for another 30 years. I'm sorry, Donna. Not nearly as bloody sorry as I am, Mr Morris. Not nearly as sorry. No, David, absolutely not. Spook Corner stops. It stops here. I'm ah. putting in the psychic detectives and that's it. End of discussion. No, it isn't. You've read the depositions. You've seen what it's done to Donna Griggs and her family. You know Fox falsified the evidence. You've heard the unedited tapes. You know what he did with them. And where and did those bloody tapes come from? And don't tell me they came from Justin's old office, because I won't believe it. Yeah. Where did they come from? After ten years, they suddenly pop out of nowhere? I'm not that naive, sunshine. It doesn't matter where they came from. The evidence is there. Fawkes destroyed those people's lives. And just for the record, I'm not that naive either. Now what's that supposed to mean? I know why you brought me in to present Satan's Playground. Oh? You spent four years as Justin Fawkes' little lapdog, keeping quiet, doing what you were told. That's not true, David. He bought your freehold and you got your payoff. He got promoted and you got your safe little basket. A nice, safe staff job. <laughs> You're right. It's bloody cold out here among the mercenaries. David! I've heard it on the tapes, Elias. He... Doesn't matter whether or not it's true, so long as it's good radio. That's what he told you whenever you started yapping. And you haven't got the bottle to bite hard. Oh, come on. When you took over Satan's Playground, you got me in for my nuisance value. The one bit of power you had left. Your little bit of revenge. After all, he was hardly going to kill off his own brainchild, was he? That'd be stupid. He was going to fight for it. And if he wanted the program, he'd have to have me too. You're getting paranoid. He might have bought you, but he hasn't bought me. And neither have you. Calm down, David. Look, it isn't that important. Damn it, it is that important. He might have oh. you to protect him, but not me. Not me. Are you going to do Spook Corner? No. OK, I'll go to the newspapers. Oh, now you're being naive. Short of him seducing choir boys in Hyde Park or banning a soap opera, they, they couldn't give a damn. They won't listen to you. They don't even understand your problem. I once thought you had more bottle, Ellis. I was wrong. Well, you go on kissing backsides. I'll go on kissing them. David! 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 <sighs> yes, I'd like to have a word with Justin Fawkes, please. Yes, I'll wait. Thank you. That's everything, Ellis. The psychic detective tape is on machine three. This is the first time Satan's Playground's gone out live, isn't it? Yes, it is. Special circumstances. I've spliced the inserts together in order. The veggie tape's on machine too. I've done my best with it, but it's still pretty ropey. So long as we can hear what he's saying, it'll be OK. Wendy, any sign of Justin Fawkes? Not yet. I've tried his office again, but he's not there. His secretary doesn't know where he is. It's coming up to time, David. I'll get into the studio. If Fawkes condescends to appear, shoot him in straight away. Ready, studio? Ready. Let's monitor network for our cue. And that's followed at 11.15 by the financial world tonight. I was uh, held up, I'm afraid. Today. Thank goodness you're here. Go straight in, Justin. Now, David Morris investigates Satan's Playground. Justin Fawkes is here, David. Hello, and welcome to Satan's Playground. This week is not only the 10th anniversary of Satan's Playground, 
but it also sees the demolition of the house that was the focus of the most celebrated poltergeist case of the past quarter of a century and of our first program. I'm going to be looking at that case with the help of this week's rather breathless guest, Justin Fawkes, dear, dear. the first producer of Satan's time. Playground and the man who first brought what became known as the house at Spook Corner to public attention. Welcome to the program, Justin. Good evening, David. You were deeply involved in the case, weren't you? How long did you spend at the house? About three weeks in all, day and night. I must say I found it a frightening and remarkable experience. That was ten years ago. Since then, I think it's true to say it's become a classic case. Thanks largely to your radio programme and, of course, your best-selling book. Yes, that's probably a fair assessment. And, of course, it had a tremendous effect on your own career. Ooh. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what you mean. Well, you're a very senior executive in this organisation today, and I think you'll agree that it was the house at Spook Corner and the awards that it won as a documentary that helped you. Well, Here that we may go. be so. Well, I, I think you're exaggerating its impact. But it did have an impact. Well, all right, yes, it did. You're an ambitious person, aren't you? No less than you are, David. But not many other people's ambitions have led, almost certainly, as yours did, directly to the death of a respected scientist and the destruction of his reputation, to the resignation of a much-loved and much-needed doctor, and indirectly to the death of Gary Griggs. Oh, straight for the jugular. That is a very serious allegation, Morris. And you certainly can't substantiate it. Uh, the fact is, Justin, that both your programme and your book are nothing more than fabrication. And I'd like you to explain why. It is no really chance. as dangerous to overstate a case, no David. Chance. These are sworn statements. This one is by Donna Griggs describing exactly how you urged her and her brother to act out incidents for you to record. Incidents that you claimed were recorded as they actually happened. Oh, come on, David. These are reconstructions. That is a normal and accepted technique in making documentaries. There's nothing underhand about it. Rubbish. Uh, not when you claim that they were recorded as they actually happened? But I never made that claim. If you had bothered to check, as you should have done, you will find that what we said was, this is what it actually sounded like. <laughs> you only must stick to facts. The fact is, folks, that you quite deliberately suggested that the recordings were real. I can't help feeling that you are rather blundering into dangerous ground here. In your programme and in the book, you had both Professor Vecchi and myself unequivocally supporting the spook corner poltergeist. That was entirely false. Well, of course we often hear these claims of misreporting by the media. What almost always happens is that somebody makes a statement to the media and when they hear themselves or see it in print, they suddenly get cold fingers, and to get over their embarrassment, they blame the press. I'm afraid that will not do. We have the original, unedited tapes at Spook Corner. Unedited tapes? Here is what Professor Fetchy really said. Damn, one of the edits has come unstuck. We've got a problem with the tape. We're coming back to you. Uh, OK. Uh, well, we'll uh, come back to Professor Fetchy's tapes later. Uh, but certainly, in my case, the interview you broadcast bore little relation to what was actually said. I'd have thought that you, with your experience in programme making, would know that sometimes one has to use the creative eye or ear, if you like, to bring out the deeper actuality. Uh, let me get this straight. What you're saying is that you have to tell lies to tell the truth? Uh, if you like, yes, there, there are some but things... But the truth isn't some kind of multiple-choice option. A thing either happens or it doesn't. You can't sacrifice facts for some sort of greater art nonsense. You really don't understand, David. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes there is just no other way to explain, to show things, real things, as they are. Yes, I did change what happened. The kids, you, Vecchi. Believe me, David, there was nothing else I could do to show, to warn, to explain. You're frightened. I've been frightened for ten years. Every day, every moment, knowing he, it, was there, waiting, 
knowing. What's wrong, Justin? I saw it. I, I looked into the child's face, into Gary's face, and it wasn't there anymore. I saw it, that creature, crawling out of his eyes. David, it, it looked at me, actually looked at me, and it spoke, David. It told me what it was. I saw it. I uh, saw it. Uh, OK, Justin, calm down. I saw it. There's no need to bang the table. Somebody, get the uh, doctor down I, here. I, uh, um, Peter, je suis Peter, uh, um, Peter. What's happening? Cue music. Film. Cue music. The disc isn't set up uh, yet. Yeah. Where's continuity? Wendy, get the doctor. Continuity, we're coming out early. Thanks. Hello, medical center. Someone's ill in B10. I think he'll need an ambulance. Je suis Peter, and I got you all. Well, I'm afraid that because of technical problems, we have to leave David Morris and Satan's playground. Gremlins in the works, I expect. However, in the few minutes before the next program, perhaps you'd like to know what we have for you tonight. There she goes, David. The end of an era, I suppose. The end of house at Spook Corner. It's about time to swallowed enough victims. Yes. Gary, his mother. Donna. Professor Vecchi and his daughter. Dr. Roney. You, me. Oh, and Justin Fawkes. Oh, hell, I didn't want to demolish him. I just wanted to chip off a few corners. He's certainly out of circulation for a long time. The doctor let me take a look at him. It's like one of the last shots in Psycho. Some comedians put a sign on Studio B10 saying, Bates Motel. <laughs> what happened, David? He didn't have a magic circle. I don't understand. Ever studied occult magic? Raising spirits? Oh, no, not my scene. The hermetic magician makes a magic circle in his laboratory. Then, one by one, in the magic circle, he conjures up each dark corner of his psyche, gives it an identity, a name. With the protection of the circle, he's safe. He can overcome that part of him in a sort of ritual magical combat. Otherwise, it can escape and destroy him. I suppose Spook Corner gave Justin a name for his own personal demon, some nasty, ambitious corner of his mind. And without the magic circle, it possessed him. Sounds a bit... sounds a bit glib to me. Uh, it's the best I can do. Well, maybe with the house being demolished, Peter had nowhere else to go. Oh, yes, you might as well read this. It's from our new controller. Meadows. She didn't take long. No, she didn't. Read it. To the irresponsible programming. Oh, it should never have happened. Severe reprimand. Oh, that's quite a slap on the wrist. More like a major amputation. Read further on. I should advise you that the situation regarding future series of Satan's Playground will be reviewed in the light of these events. Like I said, the end of an era. I can't see them letting the series go on. Oh, don't worry. Give it a bit of time. Under a different name, different format? I'm not so sure. You sound confident. Meadows owes me a favour. The unedited tapes? You worked that out? Joan Meadows was seconded to the National Network at the same time we made Spook Corner. She'd been working on the local radio and came across the Griggs case. Fawkes picked up her idea for Satan's Playground and got her into work on the series. As a leg up for a career, I suppose. She sat in on some of the early programmes, helped Justin out. I remember Peter didn't like it very much. Apart from me and Justin, she was the only other person with access to the unedited material. Oh, well done. Well, it didn't take Sherlock Holmes to work it out. You're a duplicious bastard, David. We've all got our hobgoblins, Ellis. You, me and Joan Meadows. And what's yours? Mine's a smile. A big, fat beast of a thing. Whose? It was something that happened a long time before I joined Satan's Playground. Joan Meadows invited me onto her local radio show to take on some third-rate hack who'd published one of those credulous potboilers about the paranormal you see all over the place, about people with hidden powers, spoon benders, that sort of rubbish. And we had this long argument on air. Live? Yes. Anyway, as we were leaving the studio, he turned on me and said, Look, David, you know you're right, I know you're right, but you'll never win because those mugs out there will never listen to you. You're on a hiding to nothing. He smiled, that big triumphant smile. 
I've seen that same wicked smile on sweet little old ladies pretending to be mediums and using private detectives to get information on their clients, on schoolboys bending spoons when they think nobody's looking. I've seen it on the faces of Filipino psychic surgeons pulling up bits of chicken livers and sending their patients home to die of cancer. That smile that says, nobody will listen, you're on a hiding to nothing. And you wanted to wipe off that smile? Something like that. I suppose you must be feeling a bit happier now. I mean, apart from what happened to Justin. Hell no. Even without what happened to him, there was so much heartache, too much pain. There usually is. That's why people don't want to look too close. Reality is a cold, frightening monster. Most of us are too damn scared to look it in the teeth. Except for you, I suppose. Oh, no, Alice. Even me. I've been looking at Spook Corner and things like it for 20 years now. Every single one of them just falls apart once you start looking at what's really going on. All the evidence for the real thing seems to be round the next corner. So I go round the corner, and the one after that, and the next, and I'll keep doing it. Because one day, maybe I'll walk around the right corner, and there it will be. Or maybe by then I'll be too old and decrepit to notice I've been there before. It doesn't matter. That's my hobgoblin, too. The thought that somewhere there's a crack in the mask of the real world and behind all the warts and pimples and halitosis, there's another sort of reality. One where people really do have special powers, where there's a magic that can't be explained by conjuring tricks. I wish it were there. But I don't think it is. In The House on Spook Corner, the part of David Morris was played by Frank Windsor, Ellis Weston by Michael Drew, and Justin Fox by John Abineri. Donna, Lisa Gogan, Gary, Nicholas Sergo, Mrs. Griggs, Joe Anderson, Betchy, Geoffrey Searle, Christine Betchy, Kim Hicks, Dr. Roney, Shireen Shah, Wendy, Barbara McNamara, Joan, Deirdre Edwards. Studio Manager, Lynn Sagofsky, Man, Paul Gregory. The play was written by Bob Cootie and directed in Bristol by Alec Reed. <laughs>